this time, Dr. Helen Winslow faces flesh-eating maggots. I could just feel something pull back into my stomach. They're actually not all dead, are they? Dr. Tim O'Dempsey tackles a mystery bite. When you think of spiders in foreign countries, you think of huge tarantulas running up and down. And Dr. Alistair Miller treats a terrified traveller. They can go elsewhere in the body and, and lodge somewhere. I could end up dead. I don't want that. This crack team wages war on deadly bites and alien body invasions, battling lethal infections from around the globe. Only they stand between you and bugs, bites and parasites. Liverpool's Royal University Hospital and the School of Tropical Medicine are world leaders in the field. The doctors here treat a worried army of patients, facing anything from insidious infections to gruesome parasitic invasions. Just take some gentle breath in and out through your mouth for me if you can, and just relax your head back so it's comfortable. Specialist registrar at the Royal, Dr Helen Winslow, is driven by her passion to defeat the bugs and parasites brought in from around the world by returning travellers. We're always interested to see people who are coming back from different places, particularly when whatever it is has infected them is still very much alive and wiggling along. 28-year-old Catherine Stewart, here with her husband Paul, returned from the Gambia a week ago. She's got some wriggly reminders of her trip to show Helen Winslow. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> well, you've got six in there and maybe a few of the other ones didn't quite make it. And although it might have felt rather rough, they're actually not all dead, are they? Oh, that's moved. Oh. For Catherine, the trip to the Gambia was an opportunity to see for herself the impact of her work as a charity fundraiser. I was just excited. Rather than just doing the fundraising over here and not really know what we were doing, that we would go out there, experience it firsthand, so we had some real stories to tell people when we got back. Catherine came home with more than just happy memories. It was just a red circle for the first couple of days and the others appeared when I came home. I looked at the bite on my stomach and the top of it was yellow and I thought it was maybe some pus in there and I thought if I give it a squeeze it'll come out and as I squeezed it and let go I could just feel something push, like pull back into my stomach and that's when I thought mm, there's something that's not right there with that one. <laughs> I shouted for my husband upstairs and asked him to bring me the tweezers. And I said to him, if I squeeze this, will you pull whatever it is in there out? Which he did. It just looked like a maggot on these tweezers. And I screamed. I was like, it's not, it's not, is it? Please don't tell me. And he just looked at me and said, I think we need to go to hospital. The medics at Catherine's local hospital turned to the parasite experts in Liverpool. On their advice, they used tweezers to remove a further eight maggots from different parts of Catherine's body. Never in our wildest dreams did we think that you'd come back with uh, something like that. I thought yeah. you'd come back with sunburn. <laughs> Catherine has been infested with the flesh-eating tumbu fly maggot. Her skin has come into contact with its larvae which have burrowed into her tissue, feasted on her flesh, and grown up to a centimetre in length. Dr Winslow now wants to be sure Catherine has no more unwelcome stowaways lurking inside her. We wondered whether this could be due to a parasite that normally infects dogs or cats. For the past 25 years, Dr. Timo Dempsey has dedicated himself to fighting deadly parasites and infectious diseases. It's very important for us to find out where somebody's been, what they've been doing, and their possible exposure risks. So it's a bit like detective work. Retired civil servant, 63-year-old Ken Tuby, is in urgent need of Timo Dempsey's investigative skills. Four months ago, he returned from a dream holiday in North Africa, 
with a mysterious lesion on his arm. So you brought something back from Tunisia, is it? Yes, uh, mark on my arm. I was bitten or something, and it just won't heal. Right, OK. Ken and his family were enjoying their first ever trip outside Europe. Tunisia was a little bit further far flung than what we'd normally done before, but as far as I knew, it was basically not much different to southern Spain, and uh, you might spot the odd camel or two. Ken was relaxing by the pool when he was struck by a bolt out of the blue. We were just sitting there talking, and um, my wife said to me, look at your hand. And when I looked, I had blood running down my hand. Ken had no idea what had caused his wound. He returned to Liverpool, but his sinister souvenir refused to shift. My main worry was basically the unknown. If you have a cut or a mark, or anything, eventually it heals. And this one wasn't showing any signs of healing whatsoever. That's why I thought I'd better get someone to have a look at it. Timo Dempsey needs more information in order to establish the culprit. There was two distinct holes in my arm. Right. And the blood was running down my arm really? and dripping off the fingers. Really? It was really Did horrible. Did you feel anything like Nothing. It? Nothing. That's a bit unusual. That, I mean... And those two holes stayed there for yeah. about six, eight weeks. Yeah. The detective doctor puts forward his first theory. Given the history, the possibility of this being a reaction to a spider bite was on the cards. Venomous spider bites can cause severe skin damage and even necrosis, tissue death. Now, Ken reveals a further worrying symptom. The mark would start to bubble a little bit, like a cold sore. Then it would burst, and then it would go on like a, um, a white or grey granulated, and then it would look like it was healing up, and then the whole cycle would start all over again. If you come and sit over here, just want to have a look at that under light and feel... There is, a, there is a, like, a lump you can feel. The discovery feel of this recurring yeah. cycle now leads Timo Dempsey to suspect not a spider, but an even more sinister villain. Does it itch? No. No, nothing It's just the that. fact that it won't heal. That's what yeah. worries me a little yeah. bit. You know? I mean, this may well be cutaneous leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis is a disfiguring parasite that affects around one and a half million people every year. It starts with a simple bite from a sandfly but just one bite can lead to horrific ulcerous sores. If Ken has leishmaniasis parasites in his body, his immune cells will have attacked them. The parasites will have fought back by invading his blood cells, multiplying within them before bursting out to continue their attack on his flesh. He said that it could cause problems in the future. So, ideally, the best thing to do would be to, to get it out as soon as possible. Acting on his hunch, Timo Dempsey wastes no time. He extracts a tissue sample for closer examination. I thought I'd get a tube of ointment to rub on it and, you know... Ah! Sorry. Oh, it gets a bit worse, I'll tell you. It was an unusual sight to look down and see where the piece had been taken away, looking inside the flesh of my own arm. What I'm going to do with this now is I'm going to chop it up and send some of it across the road to the Royal for histology, so they'll look at the kind of cell structure. Yes. And the other bit we're going to look at here to see if um, there's evidence of leishmaniasis. Strange to see someone holding up bits of your skin, cutting them off. <laughs> Not the kind of thing you see every day. <laughs> Coming up, Helen Winslow scours Catherine for elusive, flesh-munching maggots. You can imagine that if something is eating some of your tissue, the tissue around it doesn't like it. And Tim O'Dempsey spells out the effects of parasitic worms. we got eggs deposited in the central nervous system. At the Royal, Helen Winslow is seeing a patient, Catherine Stewart, who's had an uncomfortable encounter with a tumbu fly while she was in the Gambia. I found nine bites on my leg, my stomach, my back and my bum, um, and one on my arm. The first bite I'd had for about four days before I realised sort of what they were. Catherine turned out to be the victim not of a bite, but a burrowing. She hasn't actually been bitten 
the larvae have been put on her by her, probably her clothing or her towel from the beach which has been on the floor and then they migrate underneath the skin where they then develop. Uh oh, look at this everybody. Many travellers faced with a tumbu or botfly invasion remove the maggots without medical help. That's what Catherine and her husband Paul did when they discovered her first maggot. But DIY extractions aren't a good idea. If done badly, there's a chance the larvae might rip or split on removal, increasing the risk of dangerous infections. The best way to remove larvae is to cover the lesion with petroleum jelly, which makes it difficult for them to breathe. They then rise to the surface, making it easier to pull the larvae out. Doctors at Catherine's local hospital had a battle to extract a further eight maggots. Some of them weren't ready, I don't suppose, to have the larvae coming out, so it was very painful. There was lots of screaming, shouting, swearing. That could be a bit easier. Yeah. Helen Winslow is determined to winkle out any larvae still skulking in Catherine's body. just having a gentle feel around the edges. It's not actually too inflamed, is it? You can still feel it's a bit mm. firm just underneath. Yeah. But still, her skin's quite irritated. You can imagine that if something is eating some of your tissue, the tissue around it doesn't like it, so it becomes more red and painful. You're going to do a morning check every morning for the next week or so and just yeah. make sure, because I just can't see anything under the skin okay. there and I can't see anything poking through at all. Yeah. So I wouldn't be expecting some weeks down the line some more of these to be coming out of okay. you. It's an interesting one, we're pleased to see you, yeah. but I can't imagine it's been a very good experience. <laughs> no, not at all. OK. Not going to stop Catherine was well, eventually good. given okay. the all clear for parasites. The experience hasn't put her off going back to Africa. The projects that we're working on out in the Gambia at the moment is very important to me. It's a commitment that I've got for a long time and there's nothing, not the tumbu flies or any other illness that is going to stop us from doing what we're doing. Down the road at the School of Tropical Medicine's referral clinic, there's no let-up for Tim O'Dempsey. His latest case is a very worried traveller back from Africa. Fifth-year medical student Patrick Bogue has been working in a hospital in Malawi. Since returning three months ago, he's been hit by lethargy, rashes and breathing problems. The doctor-to-be is convinced he's diagnosed the problem. Unfortunately, I think I might have caught a parasite infection when I was swimming. Patrick was on a month-long medical placement. I was working in a hospital there with patients who received dialysis. It's an incredible country and it's known as the warm heart of Africa. Everyone's very friendly and approachable. And there's so much hustle and bustle in the streets. Stunned by Lake Malawi, Patrick threw caution to the wind. I suppose it sounds really stupid, but um, when you're there, you see how beautiful the lake is and how tropical. And I was just very tempted to go swimming and I went swimming. Patrick fell ill when he got home. Drawing on his medical knowledge, he reckons he's pinpointed the parasite. I think I've got schistosomiasis because I was in a very high-risk zone. Patrick fears he's been infected by the parasites which cause this debilitating condition. It's caught by swimming in fresh water infested with schistosomiasis carrying snails. One snail can release 3,000 parasites a day. If just a few of these burrowed into Patrick's skin when he swam in the Shisto hotspot, Lake Malawi, he will have been infected. What I'd like to do is just ask you to tell me about what's been going on, where you've been, what you're doing, and all that. Yeah. OK, so um, this summer I went on... Um... As a tropical disease specialist of 25 years, Timo Dempsey wants to make his own diagnosis. Any of us that are medics or have been through medical school, and what you tend to do is think that you've got everything that you're reading about all the time anyway. So often they may be worried because they're more aware of things they may have picked up. I developed a bit of an itchy, nondescript rash in my shins mm -hmm. and both shins. Was it soon after being in the lake or was it several days or weeks after? I being? think it was days after. OK. The schistosomiasis worms mature in the host's liver. They then migrate to the bladder or bowel, where each female worm can lay up to 200 eggs a day. 
Some cause local damage, while others are carried away by the bloodstream to cause serious harm to other organs. So I think we certainly need to investigate you and would expect to find eggs either in your urine or stool specimen. Especially as a young person, you probably think you're quite invincible or you're exempt. I just think, you know, we won't come back with anything else, but unfortunately I think I may have come back with a parasite. The complications of this disease, is there anything in the short term that you could be worried about or is it all long term? Unlike with regular patients, Timo Dempsey doesn't pull any punches with his fellow medic. Producing eggs, you can sometimes get eggs deposited in places that you'd rather they weren't, like in the central nervous system. So that's serious. In the long term, you can get eggs deposited causing periportal fibrosis, so that's kind of, you know, scar tissue in the liver. And then sometimes you can get shunting of eggs into the lungs you can get a squamous carcinoma, which is an unusual cancer of the bladder. Patrick faces a nervous wait. His blood, urine and stool samples go across the road to the School of Tropical Medicine's Diagnostic Lab. Timo Dempsey has sent Patrick home with a prescription for antiparasitic medicine which he must take immediately if the tests come back positive. So we'll just put our first solution in this tube and then we'll add our stool sample. So using this hood, it's nice, we don't get any smells. Senior biomedical scientist Jane Jones has 20 years' experience hunting down parasites in the suspect specimens of infected travellers. Parasites are amazing organisms. They've developed and adapted to conditions and human life, and they're still managing to continue their life cycles. I really do have respect for these parasites. Put a lid on that and give it an extra mix on this vortex. Jane Jones is on a hunt for eggs in Patrick's samples, evidence that there are worms living in his liver. Given his exposure history of being in the lake, it was important to investigate him. He was highly suspicious that he might have schisto, and I agreed. A week later, Timo Dempsey has a surprise back from the lab. It's not so much a shock, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we, we were thinking it was quite likely he might have schisto, and he doesn't. Patrick has had a lucky escape. He is parasite-free. Timo Dempsey is now seeing a returning patient, Ken Tuby, who is back from Tunisia with a mysterious lesion on his arm that refuses to heal. He sent Ken's tissue sample to Jane Jones at the Diagnostic Lab for DNA testing. Given that we thought it could be leishmaniasis, then investigating him for that, I think, was important, given the size of the lesion. The sample that's being run at the moment is Mr. Tooby. Um, so this is the exciting part when we find out the actual result. Jane Jones is using a lab technique called polymerase chain reaction that amplifies any parasite DNA in Ken's tissue to a level that can be detected under ultraviolet light. And this is where we can actually see the bands. Mr. Tooby is negative. No Leishmania DNA been amplified there. Where the Leishmania DNA should be, it's negative. There's no band there. Timo Dempsey has eliminated Leish from his inquiries. The original suspect is now back in the frame. How's your arm? Um, fine. The test we did here for Leishmaniasis is negative. So, on balance, it's more likely it was a spider bite than mm. Leish, in fact. Oh, good. Um, but, <laughs> well, <it's very> good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in fact, <laughs> the lesser of two evils. Yeah, it? yeah. But uh, the you know the two little dots that you mm. mentioned, so on, they'd be quite typical the spider bites. 
The most likely would be a brown recluse spider. They seem to be making something of an appearance in southern Europe and uh, North Africa. Recluse spiders are small, but potentially deadly. They're among the most venomous species of spider on the planet. So, in some ways, you're kind of lucky as well, because you can get quite nasty reactions to spider bites. Right. When you think of spiders in foreign countries, you think of huge tarantulas, you know, running up and down. And for a spider to bite me and not see it and not feel it, was a bit of a shock. So I'll take those out and that'll be it, really. Hopefully that should be yeah. it. Okay. I must admit, it was a relief to know that I didn't have a parasite inside me and it was just a spider bite. OK, right. Thank care. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Made me feel a bit easier. I've never been frightened of spiders, I must admit. I don't like killing them. I tend to pick them up and throw them out into the garden. but. I think if I saw one abroad, I wouldn't bother picking it up. <laughs> Coming up, David Lelou takes the fight against malaria to Africa. Somebody would collect on their legs 3,000 in a night. It's even worse than it sounds. And Tom Fletcher treats an emergency admission on the night shift. They just breathe normally for me. <laughs> Sad. At the Royal Liverpool, patients in the clutches of exotic and deadly diseases rely upon the skills of a dedicated and experienced team. And what time's the next one? So, no, it's eight hours after, so that would be eight in the morning, and you can pull that forward to six. Following active service in Afghanistan and Iraq, specialist registrar Dr Tom Fletcher is now honing his skills on the front line of the war against tropical illnesses and parasite invasion. I think most of us enjoy it because of the breadth of um, diagnosis that you see. The detective work, really, is trying to work out what's wrong with the patient when they come in, and that's a key part of kind of our specialty. On call at the Royal, Tom Fletcher is summoned to the emergency department. A patient's been admitted with a dangerously high temperature and struggling to breathe. She's got back from Barbados recently, apparently, and she's got a, a fever and a cough. So I thought we're going to have a look and see what she's got. Hello, Julie. How are you doing? Pretty rough. Julie Murphy is 48. Two weeks ago, she was enjoying the beaches of Barbados. Now she's fighting for breath in the emergency department at the Royal. Just the pain in my chest and my back. So just breathe normally for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sad. Oh, don't worry. All righty. Give a deep breath in. And then relax yourself back for us. OK, if you can cough us up any sputum, any phlegm, we'll take that to the lab and try and find out which bug has caused this. Julie is clearly suffering, so Tom Fletcher needs a quick diagnosis. With her chest X-ray back, he thinks he has one. The most likely thing is that she's got a pneumonia, uh, which basically means an infection of the lung. And generally, you can either see a change on X-ray such as this, or when you listen to her chest, she can hear signs of consolidation. Determining if Julie has pneumonia is critical to her clinical care. Chair, I think, actually. Can we try and whisk her up to ours fairly quickly? Tom Fletcher sends Julie to the Specialist Infectious Disease Unit before dispatching her blood and sputum for analysis at the Royal's Microbiology Lab. They're looking for evidence of the telltale bacteria behind the disease. Well, this does have quite good gram-positive diplococci, and they're described as uh, lance-shaped. They call them diplocas as two, so they're back-to-back -back against each other, and then quite a little pointy end there. This is definitive proof of the virulent strain of pneumonia that has infected Julie. Tom Fletcher hands his patient over to consultant Dr Alistair Miller. Swift treatment is now critical. People who are otherwise previously completely healthy and fit and active can become unwell with pneumonia and can become very rapidly unwell and can die before they even get to the intensive care unit. Alistair Miller is fully aware just how anxious Julie must be feeling. 
I think it is scary for a patient to come back from a tropical country and, and feel unwell. It's bad enough feeling ill anyway. And if you've been abroad and you're worried that you've caught something tropical, then that almost certainly will enhance your, um, your anxiety. Tragically, Julie has already experienced how deadly pneumonia can be. My dad had it before Christmas last year and died in the January of this year, so I'm a little bit scared. And my mum had it and my mum died not long after. Hello. I mean, the good news, I guess, in a way, is we, we know exactly what the bug is now. It's a bacteria called pneumococcus. It's a nasty type of pneumonia, and it needs probably at least 10 days and possibly up to two weeks of intravenous antibiotics. Julie has an aggressive strain of pneumonia, and the bacteria have spread beyond her lungs. Yeah. She's actually spilt the bacteria over into her bloodstream. And the worry about that is it can go elsewhere in the body and, and lodge somewhere. So she's looking at a reasonably prolonged stay in hospital. In the worst case scenario, Julie could go into septic shock. I could end up dead. I don't want that, you know what I mean? So it is quite scary. On a particularly busy late shift on the Tropical and Infectious Disease Unit, Tom Fletcher has a new emergency patient. He's been brought in with a fever of 104 degrees. Hello. How are you feeling? 26-year-old student Mohammed Imran has returned from visiting family in Pakistan. Two weeks on, he has a raging fever and severe muscle pain. I have got too much temperature. He's sort of what we call an undifferentiated fever because he's got a high fever, he's got rigors, the shakes that he describes pretty well. I mean, he's got a bit of sort of muscle pain in his legs and that's it really. There's nothing that points towards a specific area. With his patient obviously in distress, Dr. Fletcher has to put his medical detective skills to work quickly. He's sort of sufficiently sick, this chap, that um, I just phoned the lab actually and they've given me a clue in terms of what his blood count is. His platelets are a bit low. Uh, that, you know, that's common with malaria again, so we'll see what that test is. If Mohammed is suffering from malaria, then his fever is caused by his white blood cells battling against a parasitic invader. The bite of a female mosquito has injected tiny parasites called plasmodium into his blood. Having invaded his red blood cells via his liver, they've rapidly multiplied. Breaking apart the blood cells, releasing hordes of new parasites. We're just going to take another blood test to look at in the lab, OK? Another blood test. Yeah, but it's only the same as when we put the drip in, we'll just take blood out at the same time, OK? As Mohammed sweats out his fever, Tom Fletcher wants the hospital's 24-hour lab to screen his patient's blood for parasites to see if his hunch is correct. Malaria is the most common parasitic illness seen on the ward. But tackling malaria here is just part of the team's battle against a parasite that, worldwide, kills around one million people every year. David Lalu is one of the world's leading experts on malaria. Its eradication is part of his life's work. The work that has been done on malaria uh, in the tropics has really informed how we manage patients better in, in the UK. And so a lot of the work that we're doing at LSTM is around vector control, about better drugs, about better management, and all is aimed at eradication of malaria. The fight against this killer parasite regularly takes David Lalu far from Liverpool. When I come out to these kind of places and field sites, and I'm really looking at the kind of research we can do, looking at opportunities for new research, uh, and, and trying to understand more about the diseases that we're studying. David's come to the Kulumbero Valley in Tanzania. This is the largest seasonal wetland in East Africa. Beautiful, but deadly. It's perfect mosquito territory. In Tanzania, malaria causes more than a third of all deaths in under fives. David's heading to the St. Francis Hospital in Ifakara to meet Dr. Janet Bulamila to learn about the infection patterns of this indiscriminate killer. 
In a day, we are admitting uh, around 10 patients. Right. And then we expect 75% uh, to be malaria. Really? Yeah. So it's three so quarters, it's like three, three quarters. quarters. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And those, those are pretty sick children, presumably, are they? Three or four of them you can talk of it's severe malaria really in that okay. particular day. Oh, what is the experience in your country, maybe? It's a little bit different there because actually children are, you know, we see far fewer children who are sick. It's, it's severe malaria is really a disease of adults. Worldwide, malaria kills a child every 30 seconds. But there is hope for the future. Here in Tanzania, a dedicated team of researchers is fighting this devastating parasite. David Lalu has come to one of the most malaria-infested spots in the country to find out more. One of the reasons why Ifakaro has emerged as a, a research station is it's got one of the highest rates of, of infected bites that you can find in this region. This isolated town of 80,000 people is home to the Ifakara Health Institute, a leading research centre supported by worldwide partners, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Come out. Good to see you. <laughs> yes. Jerry Killeen is an entomologist from the School of Tropical Medicine. He spent the past nine years in Ifakara battling the scourge of malaria. When I arrived in 2003, nationwide, we were losing 100,000 people a year um, to malaria. So try to picture Wembley Football Stadium full of pregnant ladies and, and little kids, and, and that was the situation. Doctors like David Lalu fight the effects of the malaria parasite. Scientists like Jerry Killeen and his team attack the means of infection, the mosquito, despite the risks to him and his family. I've had malaria, Polly's had malaria twice, my daughter Eleanor's had malaria. It's not fun. We do everything we can to avoid it, but the reality is it's a part of our lives. It's a risk we have to minimize and manage. To prevent humans being bitten by infected mosquitoes, then they can't catch malaria. And, and so a lot of the research that we do here is around understanding uh, how we best kill or, or repel mosquitoes. There's no better place to do this than Ifakara, mosquito heaven. This is where the floodplain reaches when it really rains in April or May. But the key part is all the villages are built on the We're edge on the of the edge. floodplain. The mosquitoes like the nice shallow edges sure. of this floodplain. That's where they find what they need in terms of blood, the people. Jerry and his team have identified an alarming change in the mosquitoes' behavior. Mosquitoes used to bite in the dead of night. As more people are using bed nets and insecticides to repel them, the cunning pest is now tucking into its victims in the early evening as they sit outside. Inside these nets, the team is undertaking a potentially life-saving experiment on a simple outdoor alternative to the mosquito net. It involves them acting as human bait for hundreds of hungry mozzies. Rather you than me, but good luck, and I'll watch the, uh, the results with interest. Jerry and his colleague, Prosper Chaki, will be sealed inside an enclosed net tunnel. Oh, I get to release the mosquitoes, too. Yeah. Okay, great. Jerry sits at one end, Prosper at the other. In the middle, there's a cage filled with ravenous mosquitoes. To give the intrepid researchers a fighting chance, the mosquitoes have been bred at the Institute to be malaria-free. Instead of a conventional full-cover net, all that protects the researchers is a 10 centimeter high strip of sisal cloth at ground level. One has been soaked in insecticide, the other hasn't. The aim is simple, to see if the strip impregnated with insecticide repels the enemy. Three, two, one, pull. Prosper and Jerry are veterans of this excruciating experiment. What's the most you've ever had in the evening? Uh, me personally, about three, four hundred, something right. like that. Okay. Uh, but I think Prosper and his team, they've, they've hit three thousand, four thousand. That so. must get um, really unpleasant. 
yes, it's even worse than it sounds. <laughs> no, it's, really, sure it it's the worst job in the world. Sisal is cheap, available all over Africa, and simple insecticide-soaked strips like this are easy to use outside the home. So what kind of range of protection will soaking a piece of sisal material give you? We're measuring it at the moment. It certainly looks like at two metres, and perhaps even five metres, you're protected. Now, you can fit an awful lot of people into an area with a two metre radius, and you can protect them at times of the day, and they like to be outdoors. And that, nowadays, is where you know, perhaps 50% of malaria transmission occurs. Sure. You got one? Good man, Pross. So was that the sound of anguish that we heard, Prosper? Yeah, definitely, yes. This got the first one, and it, I caught it successfully. You, you caught it before it actually bit you? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, somebody attacking me. Jerry, any lucky? Nothing so far, Pross. I guess the kind of weird way we entomologists look at the world, that we, we think we're unlucky because we're not being bitten. <laughs> so, Prosper, have you got another one there? Excellent. So that's 2-0. After just 20 minutes, it's clear Prosper has drawn the short straw. I'm exposed here. Yeah. You think you're exposed? Yeah, okay. exactly. I'm quite comfortable in here. <laughs> this is the experience I would like to have outside of this cage. Jerry's sisal strip is the one treated with insecticide. He's not been bitten at all, unlike Dr. Lalu. Well, I can now guarantee that you are definitely safer inside <laughs> than I am outside. <laughs> Well, uh, that's... Sights are occurring. That does tickle my sense of humor. Yeah, I thought it might be. <laughs> you got two more. It's hoped research experiments like this will help to eradicate malaria and save thousands of lives. For the foreseeable future, Jerry, Prosper and the team intend to stick it out. I can't think of a better place to really eyeball the immensity of the malaria monster. If we can beat malaria in this valley, we can beat it anywhere. Working together, the team from Africa and Liverpool are determined to beat malaria on its home turf. It is out in the field that, that I feel most at home. I'm not somebody who feels comfortable in a lab. It's seeing what we can do in terms of prevention interventions that really excites me and turns me on. Coming up. Tom Fletcher hunts down the malarial invaders hiding in Mohammed's blood. This red blood cell is an unusual shape. It's not a nice round shape. And Julie Murphy's anxious wait is over. There you go. Still got me life. That's the main thing, isn't it? The late shift at the Royal Liverpool. Tom Fletcher has an emergency admission, Mohammed Imran with a severe fever. Initial blood tests suggest malaria. Tom Fletcher needs to find out exactly what strain of this global killer he has. All the forms of malaria can make you feel extremely unwell, but falciparum is the real killer, and that's what causes um, almost all the deaths worldwide. So it's vitally important to get a quick diagnosis. If Mohammed has the falciparum strain of the disease, he will need urgent treatment. Falciparum kills by clogging up small but vital blood vessels with parasite-infested blood cells. In the hospital's lab, specialist biomedical scientist Emma Moore tests Mohammed's blood with a rapid diagnostic kit. Like a simple pregnancy test, this gives an almost immediate positive or negative response for malaria. It's positive, but not falciparum. So we know what we're looking for is not falciparum, it's one of the three other types. It's either malaria, ovale, or um, vivax. So, so as you look at it, you can see all the normal red blood cells in the background. Um, and this red blood cell is, is, is an unusual shape. It's not a nice round shape. It's, so we call it an amoeboid shape, so the shape is irregular. And then within that, you can see that ring form, which is the malarial parasite. Oh yeah, he's definitely got vivax. Well, we've got a diagnosis, so... Uh, we'll go up, we'll start him on therapy. Mohammed is suffering from a strain of the parasite that is endemic in the Indian subcontinent. Malaria vivax isn't the most dangerous strain of malaria, but can still cause crippling fever and nausea. We've done the blood tests and it's shown that you've got malaria. Okay, you have malaria, yeah. We'll start you on some treatment now, okay. 
Um, the treatment is, is strong tablets, actually. It's not a drip medication or injection. It's strong tablets that work really well for this. OK, you'll feel better in the next few days. OK. He feels unwell now. He doesn't look great in terms of, um, you know, his pulse is still a bit high, and he feels, he's feeling pretty awful in himself. But the, the anti-malarial drugs will start to act quite quickly on the malarial parasite. Um, so he'll probably start to feel better sort of by tomorrow or the day after um, as we clear that parasite from his blood. With his positive diagnosis and speedy treatment, Mohammed joins the long list of travellers successfully treated by the unit. Not all patients in the tropical and infectious disease unit can be discharged as quickly. Consultant Dr. Alistair Miller is treating Julie Murphy, who's been kept on the ward for two weeks. She has a nasty strain of pneumonia, which she's convinced she caught on holiday in Barbados. The infection has spread toxic bacteria into her bloodstream. Just say 99 now. 99. We can. 99. So we know what the diagnosis is, and I say I don't think anything to do with your, your um, trip to Barbados. Um, so you haven't so I can go back. caught anything nasty in trouble yet. Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. We'll send it's you back. <laughs> right, okay. Very see you later. Right. Cheers. Most physicians, and particularly infectious disease physicians, have a lot of respect for pneumonia. I mean, it may be a fairly trivial infection in some situations, but there's certainly a significant uh, morbidity and mortality from it. After two weeks of intravenous antibiotics, staff nurse Tinashi Bako is bringing Julie her final dose. Hi, hey, Julie, you all right? Yeah, thanks. The last one. Yeah, last one. The last one. The staff have been brilliant, from the consultant right down to the catering staff, everyone. But he's been the main star. <laughs> he was my meter and greeter when I first came on the ward. Mm -hmm. And look, he's the one finishing it all off. I've missed going to work. I've missed being able to go out and do a bit of shopping or just mingle and being able to move outside the room. So it's just the, the freedom, I suppose. So, yeah, freedom. There you go. Still got my life. That's the main thing, isn't it? As final proof of her recovery, Tinashi removes the 30 centimetre long intravenous line that delivered the life saving drugs. For Julie, it's time to reflect on a life changing close call. This is going to change things for me without a doubt. The way that I do things and everything, it's going to slow me down a little bit for a bit of time. Two weeks ago, Julie entered the unit, fearing for her life. Now, thanks to the expertise and commitment of the team at the Royal and the School of Tropical Medicine, she joins the thousands of patients who have won their battle against bugs, bites and parasites. Oh, there's one. And you managed to get that one before you, it bit you, did you? Uh, yep. Actually, no, it was a piece of dirt. Right. <laughs> So an occupational hazard is identifying mosquitoes. Yes, in the yeah, that was actually a piece of my soggy foot skin rather than a mosquito, <laughs> which gives you some idea of how often I get out of the office. 